about your the student research logs? Like, how did the, what tool did they use to do that? What kind of information were they putting in there? Sure, great, yeah, um, that's a good question. They, uh, like Jade, we use Google Docs, so Google Docs was really um, important. And they used Google Doc, and they had to write down every time they did research what the date was, what URLs they looked at, what documents they looked at, who they interviewed, if they found images, and they plugged everything in. Did they put it in a spreadsheet? Or no, it's just Google Docs. Docs. Just okay. Google Docs. And uh, most importantly, they made me an owner. Yep. So I now own those Google Docs, and just to be very, very certain, I actually made copies of all of them yep. so that I had them, right. so that I didn't end up losing them. Okay. Yeah. And the, the, the Thing that you just said about the, the ownership problem with story maps, is there a workaround for that that you know yes. going forward? Yeah, there is a, they have a workaround that they can do, but there isn't a way, I think Jade had mentioned wanting to work on them collaboratively, and it's it's a single user right. login, and so they haven't figured that out okay. yet, that I know of. They will. <laughs> yes, right. hopefully they will, but they've been very helpful. I'm on Tucky Lance <coughs> Basil this semester, so I've been doing other things, so I honestly haven't made the time to try and figure it out, but they have offered to do so. Do you, do you know if uh, StoryMap supports different conceptualizations of time? Um, that's a good question. I have only used it for these chronological um, movement. They have. They are very responsive. Um, you could email them. I don't know if you you didn't find that it worked very well for that in your project. Well, yeah, just because of the, we were just using it, it moves you from slide to slide, you know, to yeah. slide. Um, but I do, isn't there, a, there's the spreadsheet option that allows you to kind of get behind the scenes, right, a little bit? Yes, and, and you do decide what, you decide what all of it looks like. So it's just empty and you put, you put in the pins. Um, you could title this, you know, it could be thousand year periods or it could be, um, whatever you really want it to do. It, it, it is flexible in that way. Say. And it's very easy to use, it's worth playing with. Could I ask what is a different conceptual conceptualization of time? Like the Mayan calendar. Uh -huh. exactly. Yeah. You could use it for that very easily because again it's not it's completely I mean, even like, it's yeah, I believe it's geographically based, not because um, Night Lab also has Timeline JS, which is their, it's like a sister tool to StoryMap.js. Um, and Timeline JS, I think that that enforces like a very specific right. kind of chronology. I'm just trying to find Safari to show you what it is. So, <coughs> if any of those questions for the other, um, I have a question for the main room. I was wondering if you ever bring the maps up to like current day, or if you were in time for this. And I know your goal is to teach this <coughs> modern period, but do you make those connections with students? Because it seems like that could be really interesting too. Um, you mean the connection, like geographical connection? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, of course. This is part of the, the what they, they, they do. But I mean, the, the most important part for me is that they can understand the text related to the, the maps. Mm -hmm. But for them, is is something that it come naturally that they just wanna make the connection to the real space. Right. Okay. <coughs> oh, anyone? I have a question for Jade, but I think all of you have been saying this. So I was interested, you know, when you were talking about, um, you know, one-off mapping versus uh, sustained mapping, and. Yeah. Um, the balance between the minutia of like the software versus the critical payoff. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, you were saying that like, you know, the sustained mapping there, it was a very low ratio of, of, um, of critical payoff. And I'm just wondering, do you think that that's that's like an inverse relationship? That the more technical aspects there are, to kind of distract you, the the harder it is to, to get to the bigger questions um, in these kind of projects. I I think that it's. It, 
There was kind of both. So one of the things that we we ought to have done going into it was, you know, I made him write out a research plan and I really focused heavily on the schedule. But one of the things that I ought to have done was really have him come up with some working hypotheses. You know, I mean, he had some basic ones, which was that part of darkness is based off of Conrad's journey up the Congo River. But I should have forced him to go beyond that, right? To do more secondary research and really kind of look at that. So we could have front loaded, you know, some of the critical payoff stuff by doing that work early on. Um, and I think, but I also think too that this was a student who is very, um, he's extremely detail oriented and because I wasn't there to keep him on track of thinking of the bigger, you know, bigger picture, he got so involved on, in like, here's a specific image, here's my calculations that I did, here is like, I mean, he found amazing stuff, like he found evidence for forts that do not exist, you know, on maps today, just doing this stuff. But it, but he, but at the end of it, I, I, I think time is a really important component. So he spent almost two months doing this. And when he found that he couldn't get other people interested in all of these little tiny details he had become focused on, that's when he got frustrated. because. He didn't know how to articulate what his big intervention was in the novel. Um, and ultimately, like the big intervention ended up being him teaching the class. Like I had him in the next following week teach a class on ArcGIS. And, and that, he told me, was the, big, the biggest payoff for him. But we should have front loaded more kind of like hypotheses into, the, into it, made a more robust research plan. Um, I think we could have avoided it. We just didn't. And if it had been like, you know, say maybe a two week long project, I think he would have been very satisfied with it. It was just that when you were almost at two months and you can't get people to engage with that, you know, like two weeks, like he came up with interesting, more interesting research questions. He didn't come up with conclusions. And I think that's one of the difference. One shot mapping, they were really happy when they came up with just interesting research questions. But for two months, you want like hard <coughs> takeaways and he just, couldn't get those. Um, so I, I hope that answered your question. Definitely. Okay. So in the future, you wouldn't shy away from using more technical platforms like ArcGIS versus a simple one to store in ArcGIS? Um, I, no, I don't think I, I, I would. And actually, when he taught that class, I wish he could have come right now. But he already headed home for the summer. He's from England. Um, but he, um, he like when, when I had to teach that class, actually that was the tool that all the students were like, oh my gosh, this tool, like after using story map history pen, they were like, yeah, pretty. They hated history pen, actually they did it. <laughs> but, um, but when they got into ArcGIS, when he taught that lesson plan, I mean, it was, they, that was the one they were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, this is incredible. I wish I could, I could do what he does with that. It was, it was pretty impressive, yeah. Just very quickly, just to show you, story map is really, really easy to use, um, and you can manipulate it. So this could say, you know, Mayan, you could, you could title it Mayan calendar, and then you could have different, you can do whatever you want with it. You can embed video, uh, you can embed hyperlinks, um, you can embed images, text. Uh, there are some examples on the website, the story map website, that are really um, quite And it, it was originally designed to be used for journalism, but there's all different you know, examples of it that can be used. It's not perfect by any means. The When you're editing versus when you're previewing versus when you publish and you send the link to someone else and what they see, it's difficult to get it all to look what, the way you want it to look. And that was probably the biggest frustration students have with it. But it's a great tool. It can be used in a lot of different I just had a quick question about um, a couple of you have mentioned sort of the ephemerality of these projects. And I was just at a digital scholarship conference um, yesterday where um, digital scholarship centers, even these big centers at big universities, are talking about um, nothing is permanent, like writing memorandums of understanding with faculty that they would host something for a year and then it goes away unless the faculty member deals with it. Like, what do you want to come out of that in, in terms of, of permanent? I mean, is it okay that this all goes away? Because that seems to be where everything is going. And it sort of surprised me that there was no kind of consideration of more permanent scholarly communications, like how digital scholarship can ever be part of a kind of bigger scholarly communications 
you know, ecosystem if we're just talking about everything disappearing, right. and yeah. especially in the student end, like, what is it that yeah. should be <clears throat> around so after the class is over? Actually, so we, I mean, this has been a huge problem, even though it, there's another part of me that's, that keeps asking, why is this a huge problem when essays are so disposable, uh -huh. right? But we invest so much in the final essay. But, um, but actually, my department recently has started tackling this. And this is, sorry, I'm just jumping in because no, I've been no, really no, excited no. about this. But a few members of my department have actually, who have started doing these digital assignments, have started talking about moving to a portfolio um, kind of mm -hmm. um, method, I guess. Of, so every single English major from their freshman year onwards would create what we would call a kind of a transportable digital portfolio, mm -hmm. which would be a log of all of the work that they had so that by the time they graduated um, with their English degree, they'd be able to kind of show this to a prospective employer, to graduate school, and say, this is my digital portfolio of all the things I've created over the course, including research papers. Um, so that's an idea that uh, we've been tossing around, whether or not it, we're going to end up adopting it is another issue altogether. But there's about, I think, it's li like Lisa, Claire, me, um, a few of us have been yeah, have been, have been playing with this idea of moving towards a portfolio model. I think it's a really important question because I pulled up this slide. This is our um, student government association president who's just graduating, who's a history and public policy major, but she's worked for me and she takes my classes, but she's not someone who is interested in art history. And she actually got a paid, one of maybe five paid summer internships at the New York Historical Society. Paid internship in New York City, you can only imagine, it's like finding gold on the street. Um, in part because of this project, but the project wasn't public. And so what she had to do was say, can you please make it public and can I share it with them so they can see what I did? And they explicitly said to her, we had hired you, we, we gave you the internship in part because of the work you had done here, because it showed that you knew what you were doing. And I have examples of other students who have come to me and say, can I, make, can I show this to someone? Can I make it accessible? So we know, at least at, at Wheaton, we know for a fact that these projects are having a positive effect on students getting professional opportunities outside of Wheaton. And it's something that I tell them that they should put on their resumes, that they did a project like this, because it's a huge investment of time and energy. And, it, and it's real work. It, it really is adding to scholarship. Um, of our collection, but also, you know, Domingo said scholarship on um, the new world and um, scholarship on Heart of Darkness. And so I think it is important to find a way to make sure that they're preserved. The library um, recognizes the challenge. I'm not saying they have an answer, mm -hmm. but they recognize the challenge. And I'm lucky, I control my own budget for the collection. And so often I admit, if I need something as a faculty member, I'm like, oh, that's collection related, and I just pay for it. Uh, like the Omeka, like the Omeka account. And I know not all faculty can do that, but it is a way to try and preserve some of these projects. Any other questions? Okay, we're gonna have question. I have another question for all of you. Um, what was your, you know, did, were you ever like formally trained in like digital humanities methods? Or like what was your technical background before this? And so, and that the second part of this, have you ever, have you tried to champion these kinds of methods to less technically inclined faculty? I had none and no, and I was trained in England and didn't even know what digital humanities was when I apparently started doing it. So that's the short answer for me. Um, I, I got my PhD at Brown University, and then I had the opportunity to work with uh, people who were doing digital humanities by then, like Julia Flanders and um, others. And, and then I, I got some training, or at least some idea that, that when I went to Wheaton, I just wrote that there. But I think digital humanities is, is a discipline that we all can fit from. Because it's it's what gives our our course. And and for me, I was um, my exposure to it was that administration at Northwestern, where I was a graduate student, was um, they were interested in digital humanities, but there was almost no one doing it basically. And so um, they said they basically told me, um, well, if you're willing to create you and a librarian, we kind of proposed together, we'll teach ourselves digital humanities. Me as a graduate student, him as our kind of like as, as you know, our librarian fellow, you know, postdoctoral fellow. Um, they said, we'll give you guys summer funding um, if you teach yourself 
this stuff, come up with a syllabus, do a final presentation at the end, you know, kind of work your way through it. And so it was a two month crash course that we create that I work with this librarian on. Um, and that's, that was my only exposure to it. But, so I don't consider myself a big digital humanities person. I'm still, I'm still trying to teach myself by talking to Domingo. So or Leo. now I have my own course that is called Digital Humanities um, uh, Tools and Methods. So I teach them several uh, tools that they can apply to other courses. And I was happy this, this semester that I taught this course that one of my students that was a biology major when she presented her, uh, her um, thesis, she used some of the tools that I taught her in class. So I was so happy to be there and so very nice. And Jenny's background is in um, the software industry originally, right? And so when you came to me and Wellesley, did you have, did they ever give you official training? Or? Uh, oh, well, the, um, there was, that was so long ago that it was, there were, not everybody had email. So um, it was, there was, there were, the, the interest in the, human, in the humanities um, was uh, sparked by a Mellon grant. And so, yeah, I, I did uh, leave industry to support the Hispanic Studies Department at Wellesley College. I think there's definitely, faculty like, having the opportunity to learn about it. But I think at Wheaton, because it's a small campus, we often just learn from each other. Yeah. But I think having more organized opportunities would be really fantastic, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. 